Hello everybody, Julian Charles here of the MindRenewed.com, coming to you as usual from the depths of the Lancashire countryside here in the UK. And today we have uh, a somewhat unexpected interview, actually, that was arranged just a few days ago with the filmmaker John Masseria, who will be known to many TMR listeners because John kindly made a couple of very effective video versions of TMR interviews fairly recently, one with Paul Craig Roberts and one with Tom Secker, or I suppose I should say um, half of one with Tom Secker because part two I think, That's right. is, I think is still on its way <laughs> I'll ask you about that in a bit um, John has many many projects under his belt uh, too many for me to mention really but I will just point out his documentary with the artist Anthony Frieda who was on the show last week uh, documenting the moment when Anthony Frieda met with the curators of the 9-11 uh, Memorial Museum to have a piece of 9-11 truth art accepted into the official collection quite a short film but I do recommend everybody to take a look at that anyway we'll leave that for the moment so i'll say john welcome to the show good to be speaking to you hi julian thank you very much for having me on well it really is good to be speaking to you actually um so thank you ever so much for doing those things that you've done for the mind renewed it's uh, really great but i mean i wish i could say more about you but when i've looked at the details you've led me towards they're a bit convoluted so i thought probably the best thing to do would be to ask you to explain a bit more about yourself what i've said hardly encapsulates what it is you actually do the scope of the projects that you're involved with so could you tell us more about yourself what you've worked on what you are working on at the moment and um perhaps some of the people that you've worked with as well Sure. Well, Julian, um, just recently I just finished up uh, a small filming in New York with Michael K. Williams. Uh, he's an actor who played um, in Boardwalk Empire and The Wire. He was Chalky White, as many people might know him. He also played um, Freeway Rick Ross in Kill the Messenger. So that was the last project I worked on. That was something called uh, Unjust Justice. Right before that, I was working on SEAL Team 6 documentary about Extortion 17. You've also had the pleasure of interviewing Charlie Strange, the father of his slain son, Michael Strange, who was uh, the NSA SEAL Team 6 liaison in that whole debacle and how that helicopter got shut down and the three eyes in the sky were shut off. And that whole entire lie and setup was uh, all documented over a four, five-day period tons and tons of research, lots and lots of paperwork going through. He has over 1,300 pages of photographs of his son not being burned. And that was a very moving project for me because I really felt the desire to help that man try to reach as many Americans as they could. Absolutely. And I find it a great privilege being able to speak with him as well. It was a case that had interested me and concerned me for quite some time, actually. So it was very good to speak to both of them, Mary as well. Um, I mean, is that documentary reaching completion now? Uh, they're still working on the completion of it. I know I've seen a 15-minute clip of what they did. They're working on it in California. Uh, the production was done by a man named Don Sikorsky. He does a lot of films about military and such. And he had me go out there and do the interviews and the filming and the audio and all that stuff. And I thought it came out beautiful. We'll have to see how they present it. Uh, you know, I do have all the raw footage. So if they don't present every... I think there's a clause in there where if they don't release all the information... I have the permission from Charlie Strange to release whatever they don't use. So um, one way or another, the truth will hit the public mm -hmm. from that interview. And you've done work with uh, Richard Andrew Grove, Tragedy and Hope, is that right? Correct. Well, Richard and I are friends. Uh, I respect everything that he pretty much puts out. He's an intellectual. I visited his home a few times, and his library is quite extraordinary. He's got over 4,000 books at his house, uh, all color-coded with little tabs of paper meaning something to him. I didn't really ask him what each colored tab meant, but um, brilliant man. And we worked together uh, along with seven other film guys, camera guys, should I say, to film William Binney, uh, who's the NSA whistleblower out in uh, Connecticut. He uh, came by train. A lot of people don't know this, but he doesn't have the use of his legs. Oh, you know, wow. that was quite a long trip for him. And to come out yeah. and do this interview was just amazing. He's an amazing man. In my opinion, he's the first whistleblower to tell everybody that we're being spied on blanketly since 2001. He, you know, retired from or left the agency and became a whistleblower, along with Tom Strake and so many others. Mm. And that leads us to Tom Secker's thing that we did. <laughs> I'm not quite finished with your interview with him because I'm not entirely sure whether or not Snowden is compromised or not. Mm -hmm. I'm still on the fence, and I think that's probably the reason why I haven't released it. I think that overall, he's a controlled leak. 
because if you look at all the other people that, you know, like Thomas Drake and William Binney, they were the first people. Why didn't they get more coverage back then? Some could say that there's more documentation there. There's more paperwork with Edward Snowden. But then you look at who he leaked it to, Intercept and so on, and The Guardian. You look at how they're being funded and through PayPal. There's a lot of questions there. But again, no concrete evidence for me to say for sure except speculation. Sure. Well, I, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll let you off that one because, as you know, <laughs> when I was speaking there with Tom, um, I think I made it clear in the interview that I wasn't 100% behind what he was saying there. And I think, you know, he makes a very, very good case and I think it's to be taken very seriously as something to look into. So I quite understand. And I've actually received some criticism for even covering the issue, which I think is quite interesting in, in its own right, um, as if Snowden is a sacred cow. You must not touch, but I don't think that we should be like that, should we? We should actually listen to arguments that are well made. Um, he is most certainly certainly a controlled leak that they allowed to speak out and whether or not that was a confession or not mm. of the NSA to say, look, this is what we're doing. I think that's more plain and obvious to most people. Right. They obviously did do a media blitz with him. Uh, William Binney, <laughs> he really hasn't seen too much. Uh, <laughs> or Thomas Drake hasn't really seen so much. Maybe they're not as good looking or as flamboyant <laughs> as, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Snowden. But, um, you know, look, look at Oliver Stone is making a movie about Snowden again. That, I'm sure, is going to be all theatrics and very little about what we know about how they're being funded. You know, the people that got the resources and the hard drives and all that stuff and how that was all theatrics. We know a lot about the case. I, I encourage other people to go listen to that section of your Tom Secker interview and make a decision for themselves. I'm still not throwing it out, but I'm looking for a little bit more evidence. Sure. That's all. Yeah, absolutely. So if you don't do the second part, then I won't criticise you. I shall understand the reason for that. Okay, so we're, <laughs> we're clear between us why, why that is the way it is. So, I mean, how did you get into film production work itself? Is that something that you've done pretty much all your life? No, I guess I should really start from when I uh, became an activist, because mm. I didn't choose it. It kind of chose me. Uh, I owned a business in Westbury and, and Hempstead and, and Brooklyn that dealt with chemicals, PFOAs. I didn't know much about them. They were called Teflon. And then I started to realize who was manufacturing, which was DuPont. And then I started doing research and I had a website up called Exotic Audio. It was basically an expose on beautiful audio equipment because that was what I was into at the time. And I used that side sections, like on the left and the right, to do news articles that would kind of inform people. So I did a big expose on the uh, PFOAs or C8 from DuPont, which is basically an additive to make um, Teflon products and the like, uh, liquid or whether it be metallized compounds that are manufactured and the implications on the weather and the environment, uh, how it goes into every living cell. It goes into all living bodies with blood. They go into the water systems. It's basically polluted every single surface on the earth with PFOAs. Now, this is a definite thing. You know, there are lots of cases of this poisoning going on in the water system. So I felt compelled to make articles about it. And every time I did that, this is back in the 1990s, like 96, 97. Uh, the internet was kind of new. Uh, anyway, they started to scrub all the articles that I would link to. So I would show the picture and then have a link, and the next few days, the link would be gone. So then I started to realize that they're being taken off the web, and uh, a lot of lawsuits and stuff like that from DuPont and the citizens of contaminated areas were being settled, and those websites were being scrubbed. So that's how I kind of became an activist, even though I didn't really call it activism. I was just doing my part to let people know that this was going on and what I did find out is that every single living being on this earth, whether it's a fish, whether it's a, a reptile or, or a human being or whatever it is, it doesn't matter. As long as it breathes and has blood, it's affected with PFOAs. The effects of this is still being discovered. And if you want to know a little bit more about it, um, PFOAs was originally designed to coat the wiring on the nuclear bombs that were done in the 1940s. DuPont had the patents on it. And they were working to mix oil and water together and make it stick. And that's why it's so prevalent because it goes into the hydrological cycle and gets recycled into the, the clouds and then back into your water system and so on and so forth. It never goes away. It continuously affects our, our water system today. And nobody talks about it because it's been highly scrubbed. Okay, so there is a suspicion there that it is actually detrimental to 
life. Well, it, it is a bioaccumulable. Uh, it goes through your system and then flushes out and then goes in again and goes out. But it's bioaccumulable in the sense that it's not going away. It just keeps accumulating. It goes into the fatty tissues of the body and it causes cholesterol increases. That's what they have already admitted, but they say that, oh, don't worry, this will not kill you per se. But there are all sorts of implications in PFOAs. But with the world the way it is now, there's so many other issues that PFOA has kind of been swiped to the side, you know, because there's nothing you could do about it. It's going to continuously multiply in the environment. There's nothing that will get rid of it. So let's move on to the, <laughs> yeah, the next sure. bad thing in the world. Sure. Um, it is indicative of a certain irresponsibility, isn't it, in the way that human beings tend to conduct their affairs. And so it's a good reminder to us to be wary of just chucking things out into the environment and hoping they're not going to hurt anybody, uh, especially if there's something like that that's not going to go away. Anyway, as a consequence of that involvement, then you presumably thought that you would turn to filmmaking as a way of speaking about this kind of thing. Well, uh, originally I did uh, some short things. Uh, people would talk on the talk radio and they had no videos. So I felt compelled to make small little videos for these people just to get the word out. And it did help. Um, one man, his name was Dean Wigginton. He was ready to give up on what he does. And I just loved this talk that he did with Russ Tanner. And I thought so much of the conversation that I felt compelled to capture it and make it into a video. And it worked. And uh, he actually called me a few days later and thanked me and said, listen, I was about to give up. And you came along like a miracle and rejuvenated all these conversations with Coast to Coast Radio and all these other situations. So even today, five years later, he and I still talk and I wish him well in, in his mission to keep voicing out what's going on. Okay, and it's developed from there. And of course, one of the ways in which it has developed up to this point now is that you're working on a documentary film project, which is called I Love My Country, But I Hate What They Are Doing. Um, I'm going to ask you about that title in just a moment. Uh, but um, mm -hmm. <laughs> now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I understand that it's one third complete at the moment. And of course, you've kindly allowed me to preview that first part. And I have to say, I really do think it is a very well-made and very effective production. It's a good piece of work. Now, um, looking at the subject matter that you cover, I would just very briefly say it's, you know, how the U.S. has become dominated throughout the 20th century and into the 21st century by the military industrial complex. That's how I would summarize it. But do you want to give us a brief introduction to the film yourself? And perhaps you could explain why you gave it that title. Sure. I actually was working on something else called Follow the Money, which kind of outlined the money sources of um, kind of black operations that we do without the public's knowledge or with Congress's approval. And that goes back to Oliver North in the um, Iran-Contra trials. It's a fascinating nine-minute, like small little tiny documentary. It's very fulfilling. You, you have your beginning, you have your middle, and you have your end, and it all ties up together nicely in nine minutes. Uh, I released that, and that went viral to like 75,000 views, I guess. And then it kind of just stopped. And I was like, well, that's interesting. But I'm sure people are copying it, and that's how it morphs into something else. People mirror the information, and I don't mind that. I encourage that because that's how we get the information to grow. Hmm. But from there, I started to do more and more research. And then I came across Tom Henson and um, Dr. Grenzer, and I just was so impressed with their interview that I said, you know, there's – vital information here that most people probably would feel maybe they might start it for 10 minutes and then stop it because it's just too intellectual for them. So I felt like, you know, maybe if I put it into a film, people will watch it. And it's just facts. They're all facts. Yeah, I like the way you do that. It's a good point, actually, because, yes, it is a bit dry, isn't it, listening to such an interview? I mean, he's a, he is a good speaker, there's no doubt about it. But, yes, quite, if he's listing fact after fact, you know, people can switch off. But by having the structure of the, the video presentation, I think it does keep people's attention really very well. Um, talking about the title, I know that you had a number of choices that you were wondering about, but you did go for that title in the end. Is it very common in the U.S. that if you criticize the government especially as regards foreign policy that you you are actually accused of being unpatriotic because i just wonder if that's the kind of fear that you might have that's expressed in your title you know i love my country but i hate what they're doing yeah to be honest i felt like that title would address so much because i really do love the core of what this country is about mm. you know you guys have your magna carta and we have our constitution i love the constitution i think it protects almost all of our rights almost all of them that are given to us by birth just like judge Napolitano says these are god-given rights that we were 
born with that should not be questioned uh, whatsoever, but um, they're being revoked under the name of freedom and democracy and protection and all these things have just been mixed together and people are just like, well, okay, they're telling me this and that sounds fine. I have to believe them because they're my government. I think it's a mommy daddy kind of mentality. You know, mommy and daddy will never do you any wrong. So you could love your mommy and daddy, but you hate what they're doing. <laughs> you know, is that such a conundrum? If you were to ask Anthony Frieda, and he and I did so many interviews together, he would say, listen, it's your patriotic duty to speak up when there's corruption. If you're standing by and letting people get murdered, or if you're letting corruption go on, let's face it, if you and I were to trade drugs or drug money uh, with a, a known terrorist organization like HSBC who's been caught not just once but three times, and we have whistleblowers coming out of the woodworks all the time saying, listen, they're still doing it. We would go to jail for just $100 if we traded with any one of those organizations, whether it be drug runners or gun runners. But they can do it. That's more than a hypocrisy. This is crazy ludicrous. This is craziness. These people have to wake up and say, oh my God, really? It's too big to fail and there's also too big to be held accountable for anything. <laughs> absolutely. absolutely ridiculous. Uh, nobody's assets were seized. Are you kidding me? This should make everybody upset. This is not about my country. These are about a few corrupt people that have infiltrated every aspect of control and written laws to protect themselves. It's so crazy. It's out of hand. This country's gotten out of hand, and we're supposed to be the beacon for hope and truth and freedom and democracy. But we're using that as a guise for false pretext to control more resources. And of course, this is Dr. Daniel Aganza's point, isn't it? Because he does a lot of research with resources and how war is used, you know, justifying getting hold of resources. And uh, towards the end of your film, in the interview that you use, he, he said that he did actually believe the kind of official position on things that, yes, all these wars that the West are involved with is to do with you know, helping around the world. And he's come to realize that's not the case through his research. And he lists masses and masses of bombing campaigns that the U.S. has led uh, since the Second World War, and it's an absolutely amazing list, isn't it? I mean, Korea, Guatemala, Indonesia, Cuba, That's Congo, it. Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia, it's just an incredible... Yeah, when it's listed out like that in the film, and he talks about it, each part is broken down, it's hitting you. Listen, we all know that we've been in wars, but do you realize how many wars? Dr. Gensler outlines it beautifully, and it goes hand in hand with the illustrations that I think I put to film. Tommy Hansen is a great journalist, a person who really cares about people in general. If that's me. That's me. That's Dr. Gensler. You know, that's Anthony Frieda. That's Gerald Salente. That's Ken O'Keefe. We, we really do believe that people are the same. If you're about treating everybody the same, then that's who I'm friends with. You know, if you think that a certain type of person deserves to be above the law and certain other people below it, then you're not my friend. And what, and what you're saying there is the kind of thing the vast majority of U.S. citizens would say, and the vast majority of British citizens would say, exactly right. We do want to treat people as fellow human beings. And of course, it is the fact that our societies have been hijacked by these agendas. It's not the U.S. It's not the British. It's this military industrial complex and the, the powers that are behind that are bent on domination in various ways that uh, we need to be wary of and aware of. And I think your film makes that distinction very clearly. Yeah, and you know, the 31 minutes, Julian, the 31 minutes that I put there, there's one issue that I had with the Iran 1953 yes. coup, but I put that in the film. I don't know if I did the right thing by putting it in the very beginning of the first five minutes, but I needed to paint with the brush that is we infiltrated the government of Iran. I'm not a fan of Iran. I'm not a fan of any country. I'm a fan of humanity. So yes. let's just set that aside because that was one person who spoke out. But if we can go into a country that's duly elected, democratically elected person in their own country and put in a dictator, and not only that, we hired provocateurs we paid these people to riot in the streets and kill people and do as much damage as they could to make it look like, well, there needs to be a regime change, all under the guise of freedom and democracy. Meanwhile, we're doing just the opposite, putting a dictator in, and just really the underlying cause is oil control. I didn't even include the oil control in there because that might be too much for people to handle. If we could do all those things, look at, look at Donald Trump. 
I, look, I'm not saying I don't like any of the choices. I think they're all horrible. I can't believe that those are the choices for America. Are you kidding me? It's almost like Esquire magazine or some horrible Sun magazine. Uh, it's horrible. Every single choice is just a, a mockery upon this country. Oh. But I'd like to see somebody like Patrick Wood be uh, elected or somebody who's intellectual, who understands the history. Or, <laughs> I'll give him the good news. <laughs> yeah, or Bill Still, who did the Money Masters. These are people that understand the real underlying problems of this world. I don't say world like, you know, just the United States. I mean, we're affecting so many different countries. But at the same time, you know, Donald Trump was infiltrated. They definitely hired provocateurs to interrupt his campaign to make it look like these people really despise him. And now you need to look at 1953. And we did the same thing in Iran. We hired provocateurs to make it look like we hate this guy. And no, these are just paid provocateurs. They're actors acting out to dollars and bribery. If we could do this in 1953, only six years out of the CIA, you know, the CIA was just created six years earlier. We did this with the help of the MI6 and the MI5. If we could do that, all the other things make sense. We're not doing it for democracy. We're not doing it to make people free, make things better. We're doing it for the select few. I agree, and I actually think that it was a good thing to do. So why do you think it was not a good reason to do it in the way that you did? I, I think that a lot of people might just, uh, again, just like in music, you have your beginning, you have your middle, and then you have your end. And I think the ending is beautifully strong. The middle is great, but that very first one quarter of the beginning, I don't know if I'm convinced that that's the right thing to do. So right. it's only the first edit, Julian. So you know, I haven't heard anything negative mm, about mm. it, but I just think a lot of people might turn it off and say, well, I don't want to know about 1953. Yeah, I get your point. So that's from an artistic point of view, isn't it? Yes, you want to get things um, in the right proportion so as to get people's attention. I, yeah, I think I, absolutely. In fact, I did want to ask you some things about the artistic element to it, of course, which is very important in such a work. Um, I like the way that you start off. You juxtapose some images. You have images which have visual similarities, uh, but they have different meanings. So, for example, you have this, you told me it's called the mark. Is that right? This sort of narrow type center of a typewriter in one shot. And then you switch scenes and then you map that shape onto a narrow war-torn street in Iraq, I think, or Afghanistan. I think probably Iraq. And then you also map it onto the narrow bombing bay of a, a bomber aircraft, receiving its load back from the ground, almost as if the type words of the typewriter could bring these wars to an end, you know, bring the, the bombs back from the ground. I mean, I like those techniques that you use there. Um, they're, they're very powerful, actually. What, what inspired those particular kinds of technique? I think it's a combination of trying to put forward that we can make a change and even with the old technology of just communication. You know, the printing presses of yore. Uh, then you have the radio, which is very powerful. We all know these mediums, but most people forget the typewriter. This is a very basic way that people used to put out pamphlets and either put out their propaganda or put out truth. People would use these mediums. But the typewriter is still a very powerful and the noises and the sounds that it makes in America, at the beginning of every news broadcast, they would have a typewriter. Somebody was typing the news and they were reading it. Yes. And that was like the intro to every news format. You know, there would be a typewriter and then they would go into the news and this is the news. But there's a lot more in there. There's an upside down sure. triangle, uh, you know. Uh, I didn't spot that. Yeah, okay. Where is that? That's at the very beginning, probably three seconds in, and then it kind of pushes it down a bit. It is an upside down triangle, and it's just part of that particular model of typewriter. Uh, pushing the bombs back in by putting the paper in means loading up your intellectual self instead of uh, loading up the obvious, which is... Um, you're going to do something wrong, I'm just going to punch you out or hit you or destroy you with bombs. So let's try to use our intellectual thought process, which is putting the paper in and start digging into it. Um, I think our solutions are no longer to de-escalate, as Dr. Ganser says. We don't try to de-escalate. We don't try to negotiate. Where's our negotiation skills? They're gone. It's just war. <laughs> okay, you're doing this? War. <laughs> this is not a solution. This is yeah. just a, like a knee-jerk reaction. <laughs> It's horrible. Yeah, more and more war until we're all swallowed up in it. Yeah. yeah so I mean, I, li I like the way you yeah. use the, the old fashionedness of the typewriter as well. You know, obviously it has the, the pen is mightier than the sword kind of idea there. But I like the way it also says, I mean, I'm being very subjective about this, but that you don't have to be all technological in order to make a difference. You exactly. know, just through word of mouth, just through even writing 
an old-fashioned letter to somebody else. We can all be part of this. We don't actually have to be sitting in front of the latest computer in order to make a difference. It also has to do with Tom Henson, who is printing material out and giving it to his members. His thought is that it's more serious than an article that was just fabricated through pixels. Well, there will be some people who do react in that way. Yeah, I mean, there's so much stuff that's on the internet that it almost has uh, no currency in, in some people's view, I should think. And maybe people of a, I don't know, whether people of an older generation. I mean, certainly I know a lot of people of an older generation who just have no connection to the internet at all. I'm quite suspicious of the internet. So if they actually had something printed in front of them. I think they'd take that a lot more seriously. Absolutely. It's just another means of the symbology. Mm. Yeah, we need to use everything that we have, whatever position we are in life, to use the resources that we have to get across these messages. I mean, there are a number of other things that I love about the part of the film that you've created. I mean, there are some particular moments that you've used which made the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end. I mean, you have some infrared footage. Uh, I think it's from inside a helicopter where some soldiers, presumably, yeah, they are US soldiers, are machine gunning some targets in Iraq or in mm-hmm. Afghanistan. That's pretty horrible in itself. But then, of course, you get that statement by the gunner, the sound of freedom right there. And, you know, you can hear the irony of the guy sort of struggling with what he's doing. You know, half of him is saying within his own mind, this is not right what I'm doing. And the other half saying, but we're doing it for freedom. And, and that sort of comes out in that ironic statement. And, um, you right. know, I, I, love, and I love the way that you include things like that. Th- thank you. I tried to put, again, it's only 31 minutes, but it is very fulfilling because it has so much in it. In, in my opinion, I, I'm not trying to put words in anybody's mouth, but for me, I knew it was something special as soon as I released it. It's probably one of my best works. But will it be appreciated by people? That's to be seen. Um, But if you could see and digest what he says at the end of that, you're right. It's so ironic. Really? You're freeing people by killing them? Hmm. This is interesting. (laughs) Exactly, yeah. And I'm not quite sure where it is, but uh, not long after that, you have that archive footage of the napalm bombing in Vietnam where it's just burning up one farmer's house after another indiscriminately and uh, you know in many cases of course their families being swallowed up in this as well and you have that soundtrack of California Dreaming going on at the same time I think mm-hmm. it's by the Mamas and Papas I'm not sure um, was it you who combined those two? No um, right. somebody took really awful footage and just put it to that soundtrack ah. and I took much better higher resolution right. footage uh, and put it back to a higher soundtrack of that I may change the song because um, if I do upload it or anybody else does copy it and put it up on YouTube, California Dreaming will come up as a shared copyright, which Uh. they allow, but it kind of puts it up on a radar and it might diminish the views. So um, I may change the song. The song doesn't necessarily matter. No, it's a very evocative song, though. I can see why whoever originally chose to put that to it uh, and why they made that decision. It had a very much uh, like an Oliver Stone-esque feel to it. And that's why I liked it, because it's so awful. And then you have this cool song. It's, <laughs> it's terrible. Yeah, yeah Absolutely. Terrible. Almost brings tears to your eyes, doesn't it? It's yeah. Just, just horrendous. And something about, you know, one house getting destroyed by this firebomb and then one getting missed and then another one getting hit just the sheer chance of it it's you just know. random bombing horrendous, on random horrendous. people yeah yeah random it's random bombing and 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 mm. we've only refined that with the drone program and through many many papers uh the drone yeah. program has, has extended that randomness and trying to say it's targeted yet really i mean don't you think a sniper would be better for targeted killing <laughs> but alas we don't want to sacrifice any soldiers uh, that's the lie that people have believed really we're not sacrificing soldiers now they're not killing themselves two or three a day from suicide for for what they're doing abroad that's what's happening in america you ask people like charlie strange he'll tell you the soldiers are coming home and committing suicide because they can't stand themselves with what they live through they can't stand yes. it. Well, I picked up on something of that, you know, that, that phrase, you know, there's the sound of freedom right there. I picked up something of that, you know, who knows what happened to that guy. Um, but he's obviously struggling with himself. It's, it's terrible. But again, I don't think the film is over the top. Like, I don't show no. tons and tons of dead children. You don't. You do it symbolically, actually. And I often think that's much more effective than just going for the guts and the gore. I mean, you use um, Anthony Frieda's piece, I don't know what it's called, but with uh, Obama uh, sort of flying in the night as a winged bird. And it sort of sounds funny, but when you put it in context with, with those drones, those white gleaming drones in the blue sky as if there's something wonderful, yes. and then you see Obama sort of flying as a bird in the night, it's, that's just creepy. That says more than if you 
shown some atrocities, to be honest. So, you know, hats off to you for doing it that way. I think it really works. Well, I mean, Anthony Freed is a brilliant artist. Yep. His art has been seen around the world. You know, look, I think that if somebody did this to your family, you would care. If they're stealing money from your pocket and you have no money for your future kids, kids, you need to know why. This is vital information being presented, but most people are... I think that they want their couch and yeah. they want their potato chips in their hand and their remote control uh, or their pint, as you say, and just relax and not worry about a thing. Everything's okay. Julian, everything's okay, right? <laughs> yeah, everything's okay. Yeah. And as, I, as you say, I do actually I have a beer here and I'm, enjoy, I'm enjoying it. <laughs> but that's only because things are, as it were, in my little world here at the moment, okay. And of course, in many people's worlds, okay. But it's soon going to be the case that it's not. I and mean, things are going to get worse. And we know that we've got this crash that's uh, going to be upon us at some point in the not too distant future. So many people are saying this. And when that happens, I think a lot of people are going to be forced to wake up and uh, take seriously these kinds Precisely. of things. So, I mean, it's great that you're out there doing this kind of thing so that one you know, of the people... biggest things julian if i could just add yeah I do. is brazil and things in venezuela people need to look at these countries and see what's going on there with the bankers i just can't i mean, there's so many topics name it they give us so much material as anthony frida says they give him material for every single moment of the day to just do artwork about absolutely so you have created a third of this film so far and your purpose in doing this I'm going to put words into your mouth, but judging by what Daniela Ganza says in the film, that it really is encouraging people to research this for themselves because that's what he did, and he changed his mind. Absolutely. I I could say that, listen, there's been tons of documentaries about Gulf of Tonkin or 9-11. This doesn't even really touch upon those. This is just about what have we been up to and why are we doing it. Really, you have to look at this. You have to see the facts of just the wars in general and what leads up to them. I don't pick apart every single war, but I do want people to do more research, but I want them more to do mm. than to do research. I want them to mm. stick with them and to say, what are we doing next? Why are we there? Mm. And you want people to be affected also in an emotional way, but as I said before, not in a sensationalist way, but to be deeply affected by it and engage with this. I want them to think about this, and a lot of people told me I watched that three or four mm. times, and I still am getting information yeah, from it. That's true. I want to make a plug for Bill Still, or William Still, who, who wrote The Money Masters, because right after I watched that, and that's a three-hour documentary, I listen, I watch a lot of stuff, and I read a lot of stuff. I went through the transcript of the Iran Contra thing that was really beautiful work for 30 hours of my time to go through all the transcripts and the videos and such. But The Money Masters really is one of my favorite documentaries. And right after I watched that, for some strange reason, I had the inclination to put this together. First, follow the money, which was uh, showing the funding of this. That's going to be for parts two and three. I'll go more into depth. Okay. Well, no, now you may have misunderstood what I said, because I think I didn't express myself very clearly. Sure. Um, I wasn't trying to create a, a kind of dichotomy and say that uh, there's the emotional way of doing things and there's the intellectual way of doing it and say that uh, you know yours is very emotional and there wasn't a lot of content in it actually I think that's not the case I, th I think you've married the two there is a lot of information in there but the way in which you express that information is actually going to affect people on a deeper level than just the cerebral and say oh yeah that's interesting information no, I think it's going to affect them more deeply than that so that's why I'm saying that I think you have done very well with it and I, I'm very enthusiastic about this project thank you I always feel like there's room I always feel like there's room for improvement oh, well. and anybody who does film don't forget I, I met these people interviewed them myself and you colorize it and you put the audio together and I, I don't even put up there who did the camera work and who did the audio it doesn't matter you know, it's all about the information and just the way you feel yes. after coming back from it. I'm glad you felt that way because that's what I wanted you to feel. I want people to think, and many people have forgotten what we've done in the past and what led us up to this point yeah. and where we're going. Look, you can't do everything in 32 minutes. I tried to do a lot. I think it has a profound effect. People who stuck it out past the Iran coup in 1953, after the five minutes, then they're kind of homegrown yeah. kind of... I think it flows very nicely, but I still have to work on that one part. Maybe some people can give me some advice on how they think the second edit should be. So how would people get in touch with you if they did want to give some advice? Um, they could find me on Facebook. 
just mm -hmm. my name, John Masaria, or they can go to the Indiegogo program. If you type in Indiegogo.com uh, and then just go to I Love My Country But Hate What They Are Doing, you will find the promo for it. You could support us if you like the film. It's up. You know, Julian, I, I originally I was at a quandary on how to release it. Mm. Should I just have the trailers to it? Uh, and then I said, you know what? Release the first edit and let people decide, should this be a film or not? If they watch the yes. whole 31 minutes or 32 minutes, and then let them decide, hey, this is something I'd like to see. I think it's different than anything else, Zeitgeist or Alex Jones stuff that's put out there. This is different. This is not like any of those things, I think. This is just beautiful interview by men who are intellectuals, and it's put to a great storyline. Mm -hmm. So you have a fundraiser going on at the moment, so that's going to enable you to continue with the project if there is uh, sufficient interest in it. So I'm recommending to people to go there. And what I mean, if people do actually contribute to what you're doing, then what do they get out of it you know, on a personal level immediately? Originally, I was going to release the 32 minutes to people who contributed for the first perk or benefit. Uh, but th I've released it to everybody. Just watch it. If you like it, if you think it's worth $10, contribute $10. If you don't have $10, that's fine. Just contribute a dollar. You can contribute whatever you like. As long as people see it and think it's important. If it's not important, yeah. if you don't think it, this topic is important, then you're, you're going to vote by it. You know, If I do my job properly, maybe I'll make something that's fantastic with your recommendations. You could send those to me as well. Okay. And I'm, I'm going to stress that it's not just any old video. You, it's clearly a quality production. So I do say to people, go and support it. I think it's well worth it. And of course, there will be links to that in the show notes. And uh, so that really sums it up, I suppose. That brings us to the end of our conversation here. But um, before I just say, okay, thanks very much, John. Um, I'm just wondering if there's anything that you want to leave us with as a parting word. Do you have anything in mind? Um, I think that everybody has a um, talent whether it be drawing or speaking or interviewing or camera work or just talking at your office, your silence is your consent to whatever's being done. And Lee Camp, who's on RT, he's a pretty funny comedian as well. He's from Brooklyn, New York. I did a small interview with him and he said, you're, you know, you're not talking about it. It's basically saying, well, I'm okay with everything they're doing. So my, my recommendation is if you're not okay with what they're doing, say something whether it's at your next dinner party or on Facebook or at work. Be vocal, because a lot of people do not know why the world is messed up. Yep, great advice. Thank you ever so much. So this is the film project. I love my country, but I hate what they are doing. And the links to supporting that and seeing the first part will be in the show notes. And do you want to spell out the actual address, or is it a very long one? I'm not sure. It's kind of long. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. If you just type in, I love my country, but not... A butt, like B-U-T. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> type that out. That'll come up on pretty much the Indiegogo. Uh, yeah. So I really appreciate you having me on, Julian. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure. Thanks very much for agreeing to come on. Thank you. <laughs>